world. This is Chicken Talk Radio Live. We are back again, man. This is the hottest podcast radio station on the East Coast. I know you're used to seeing us every Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. West Coast. But today we're doing something very early in the morning because I have a very, very busy man. And he's a great man. But, you know, once again, man, it's your boy True Knowledge. Knowledge without the D. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is me. Multi-platinum producer Ray Tracks, who's not here, the other host. And the other host, G-Man Rock, who's not here today, but it's just going to be me today, man. And thank you and a special shout-out to Who the LK War Stories Radio Live, the wonderful Hood Celebs, and our sponsors, Jerk Sauce, 25 West Mercury Boulevard, 23669 Hampton, Virginia. Some of the best Caribbean Jamaican foods you get on this side of the water with events going on every night with the sounds of DJ Sniper and DJ Slick Rick. But today we have a special guest. It is an honor to have him because he's been on very many platforms like Blog TV and a lot of stuff. And he's very busy. Very, very, very busy. I'm surprised I call him this time. Uh, you know him because he's he, he actually was portrayed in, have you ever seen a TV show, Unsolved, that was on Netflix, and it was on other uh, other uh, channels. He was an important person on the cases of the Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac. Today, we got Mr. Greg Caden in the building. How are you doing today, sir? Fantastic. Thank you. Sorry uh, sorry it took me a minute to catch up. I, like you, you're right, I'm really busy, but it's a lot of it's uh, self-imposed because I, de- I just don't manage my time as well as I wish I could. So I apologize yeah. for the delays. Okay, so Mr. Caden, first of all, tell us like your your backstory before we get into any of the stuff with Biggie Tupac. Tell us your backstory and where you come from and like what led you into everything that you're doing right now and maybe back then. Um. Well, shoot. Back in the beginning, I I was born up in uh, Lake Tahoe, um, Lake Tahoe, California, and uh, grew up with a couple older sisters and a single mom, and uh, kind of had a wayward type of childhood, you know, nothing, uh, you know, <clears throat> just wayward, you know, I didn't have a lot of direction in anything, and then we moved down to Southern California when I was really just a preteen, and I started playing Pop Warner football, and one of my buddies on that team, his name was Todd, and his dad was the coach of the team. His dad was a cop. And so as I, you know, was growing through my teenage years and, you know, getting into really kind of, um, I never got into real trouble, but I was headed that way. And his dad was like, hey, man, you really need to get your shit together. If you're going to make anything of yourself, you know, before you do anything that you can't come back from, maybe you should have tried to apply for the sheriff's department and see if you can get a good job over there. And that's all I was looking for was a good job. I wasn't really necessarily into the whole law enforcement thing. And um, I applied for the job and with his help, I got it. And then once I started working for the sheriff's department, I decided, you know, I'd like to go work someplace that's a little bit more fast paced, more action. And so I left and went up to the LAPD and joined that department. And then I started working um, narcotics and gangs and eventually homicides. So really, this guy was a mentor to me. He kind of led me into a um, you know, the direction of law enforcement, and then the rest is history. All right. So the most famous thing that I know you probably hear all the time, clearly Vlad, Vlad, Vlad from Vlad TV was asked you about it. Uh, and the world wants to know, uh, Unsolved, mm-hmm. you, were you one of the co-producers or anything on that Unsolved TV show? I was. The creator of that show had approached me and said that he wanted to do a, you know, a uh, scripted series on the on the book, basically on murder rap, and I, I was thrilled about the idea, and uh, so we collaborated on it, and then we sold it to um, NBC Universal, and then to Netflix, and everything went into motion, and we we made the series. It was a great show. It's absolutely great show. Like I like I loved it. They uh feel like y'all broke it down very well, but this big and two part thing, probably one of the biggest unsolved solved because as we can see, 
I don't know if you're big on the stuff that comes on YouTube and the videos and stuff like that. Uh, you got stuff with like Keefe D saying this stuff years later after pretty much everybody that was you were involved in pretty much isn't even on the face of this earth anymore. Uh, like, what was your, what was your feelings when that case first came to your hands involving Biggie and Tupac? Well, of course, at the time, Tupac was somebody else's, for lack of a better term, Tupac was somebody else's problem as far as the investigation goes. It was Las Vegas's. I was really only brought in to investigate Biggie's murder as a cold case because Biggie's family had filed a lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles based on some, based on some allegations and some claims. And uh, so I got brought in to work that case. And... Um, as a result of investigating Biggie, because everybody always knew there was a likelihood that Biggie and Tupac's murders somehow were connected. It was all kind of the same people dealing with each other, you know, between the Crips and the Bloods and Suge and Puffy and Tupac and Biggie and their beef. So we all knew that there was a likelihood that there was a connection. So investigating Biggie uh, inevitably led to investigating Pac. And uh, I just got pulled in as a subject matter expert because I worked gangs, I worked narcotics, and there was some allegations about narcotics possibly being involved at certain levels. And then I'd worked a lot of cold case homicides. And so I got recruited in, and then we just built a team of investigators to try to figure out what happened. Okay, so with, with the Keefe D thing, do you think that he's just saying some of this stuff just to be saying it? Just for like clout or to be online, or do you think he's just pretty much got to the point where he's like, you know what, the world wants the truth, I'm gonna give him the truth? Because on the episode of Lie, he just came out of nowhere and just just started blurting. I'm like, I've never seen this before in my life. Yeah. So you know, he confessed to us back in 2009, I think it was. You know, we sat down, we had what's known as a proffer agreement. We had built a really strong narcotics case against him, a trafficking case, and he was going to go to prison for the rest of his life. And so he had an ultimatum. He'd sit down and help us figure out what happened in these murders or just face the charges that we had built against him and go, go away forever. So he sits down, he divulges all of what he claims to know, which is he wasn't involved in Biggie's murder, but him and his nephew and some other friends were involved in Fox murder. So he confessed to the whole thing. But then years later, of course, I think he still felt like he was protected under this agreement. So he starts to go out and publicly talk about it. He goes on Death Row Chronicles and on Vlad and I think the Art of Dialogue and some of these other platforms and then, then writes a book and confesses to all this. And I think with the false assumption that nothing can be used against him. And that's completely untrue. And so you know, fingers crossed, Las Vegas takes all of those statements that he's made and, and, and drags him into court, puts handcuffs on him and puts him where he needs to be because uh, he needs to be held accountable for that. So besides this, the murder rap book, uh, this is actually the first time I know the book came out a minute ago, but I've never really got a chance to read it. So can for viewers that might not know nothing about it, can you tell me something about it? And I believe you have more books that you came out with or you're in the process of doing right now? So no, the book, the only, and again, I Murder Rap was, I wrote it as soon as I retired. Um, I had a guy that helped me write it, a professional writer, but we sat down and wrote it because I realized that all of the information that we had um, acquired during the investigation was going to go, you know, it was never going to be made public unless somebody stepped up and, you know, told the story. So that's why we wrote Murder Book, was just to inform the public um, of what we discovered in the investigations. And, um, and that's it. It's, it. It was 2011 when it was published. And then in 2015, a guy named Mike Dorsey came along. He's a documentary filmmaker, and he turned it into a documentary. And then in 2018, I think it was, they did the limited series on Netflix. So the book just kind of had three lives, so to speak. Okay. So uh, as far as that, because uh, I don't know, because I did a lot of reading up. You're doing a lot of stuff with like, are you doing a lot of stuff with like TV series and stuff like that? Or book, like, what, what do you, 
what's some of this big stuff that you have up and coming in your life? Because besides the Biggie and Tupac, we also want to know about Mr. Greg Cater. What's some 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 big stuff that you got going on that the world can know about? Well, first, thanks. I appreciate that. And it's kind of you to say that. Um, I, I run a private investigations company, and it keeps me really, really busy. And I'm traveling all the time. And that's really the majority of my time and energy is spent running this company. And uh, But I do like to still stay in the creative area. I had such a good time working on the show and meeting all these people that I continue to do consulting for shows. Um, I'm currently consulting on a show called Bosch. Um, it's a, it's a um, based on a Michael Connelly character, and uh, and then I'm there's a um, a story that I think I would like to tell that took place back in 2013, where this disgruntled LAPD police officer named Christopher Dorner had gone on a he had gotten fired, and uh, he went on a shooting rampage for like 10 days in Southern California and was killing cops and killing innocent people. And they finally tracked him down up to the mountains around here in Big Bear and he got into a big shootout with the SWAT team and the cabin caught on fire and he ended up dying. But it's this really interesting story about what happens when a person um, basically loses their, their mind and has nothing left and then they decide to take it out on society. Um, and I'm trying to tell that story, so I'm getting everything lined up for that, hopefully. Okay, okay. Man, this 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 has been just in this short amount of time it's just been so much stuff that's been talked about and it's been said and it seems like you're doing a lot of it says it seems like in the midst of all of the the stuff that went on with them this also seemed like it gave you a new perspective on life and brought you into new things and with the with the, with the TV series and how 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 do you like uh pretty much being that person that's on the sidelines with the TV series that's putting their, their input inside of everything. You know what I'm saying? This should be this way. This should be that way. That way that it looks real and it looks the way it's supposed to be. Like, is that, do you get a fulfillment out of doing that? I do. I really, really do. Um, it's, I feel super blessed that things have gone the way that they've gone and that I've had all of these opportunities. I'm, I'm really thankful. But there is a little bit of frustration that goes along with it because, um, you know, from my perspective, I want things, you know, you want things to be the way they actually are. And, uh, and that's not television. Television tells a story in order to grab people's attention and to um, get as much sensationalism and as much drama as you can. And so there's sometimes a bit of a, of a compromise um, in order to, you know, Hollywood does what Hollywood does in order to tell a story and um, you know you just got to accept the fact that that's the way it is it's never going to be you know you know to the word and to the letter of of how it actually was for instance in a small example um, in Unsolved the guy that plays my character Josh Demel, you know in the show he's he claims that you know he, he eats sunflower seeds because he is trying to avoid smoking well, I was never a smoker. And they've got my kid playing baseball. My kid never played baseball. So little things just to keep the storytelling components going, um, they make those, and you just kind of accept them for what they are. Most of the time, it's not meaningful, the changes. I think they got the historical truth of what happened to Biggie and Tupac right. Um, but like they have me meeting up with Russell Poole, who was an investigator before me on Biggie's case. And it had his own theory about things. I'd never met him in my life. <laughs> but in the show, you've got us meeting up. So those little things you just kind of have to accept as being part of the process of a Hollywood movie or a Hollywood television show. Yes, man, because you know what, man? Big ups and much respect to you and Mr. Russell Poole, man, because in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the black community, but not just the black community, communities all around the world, man, this this case became so much involved in people's lives, even people that did not know none of these people, that everybody wanted to know who did it. They wanted justice. And it seemed like y'all two were the only ones that wanted to know what really happened, wanted justice for all of that. And that, that that's something that you don't see very often. 
Yeah, and the truth be told, I mean, that's that's probably the perception because we've been the two biggest mouthpieces about it all. But that's not true as far as, you know, my the people I worked with, the other guys on our task force, everybody wanted to see this thing solved. Everybody wanted to get to the truth of the matter. And uh, all of us, you know, at the working level, we're dedicated towards that. Uh, I just happen to be kind of the face of that movement. But um, and then Russ, you know, Russ was struggling with his own demons. Um, once he left the department and was trying to figure out what to do with himself. And unfortunately, that's a tragic story in itself. But there were people around him that really wanted the truth to come out. But they disagreed with his truth. And so therefore, he got really annoyed and frustrated about the fact that they didn't see things the way he saw them. Um, but there's a lot of people who want to see the truth come out. But then you've got all these online, these, these uh, you know, um, um, these internet investigators that are trying to figure things out themselves and they create all kinds of wild theories and they connect dots that, you know, don't always connect. And then that, uh, that, that, that creates all kinds of confusion. And then that confusion settles in with the public at large because people are still like look we don't know what happened you know we're not sure you know what well, you got this and that and this and that and these different stories what's true so it really interferes with the process of um objective truth and so you know all you can do is sit there and tell the truth as you know it and and then kind of hope for the best what people can figure out for themselves yes sir yes sir but yeah man this is a uh... Hopefully, whenever you get back in the next two months, we can do a part two to this interview and just, you know, you'll you probably have so much more stuff going on <laughs> by then because you already are a busy man, man. Uh, the interview won't go be that long, but this was like, in this amount of time, I believe a lot of people are going to be satisfied because they got to know you as a person. They got to know stuff about that, but uh, social media or anywhere where they can get in contact with you, uh, see what you got going on with other TV shows. Could you let, just let the world know where they can go? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I've got a public profile or just my personal profile on, on Facebook and Twitter. And, um, you know, you're, you're welcome to put my information out there, my email, whatever. I try to answer as many questions as I can um, to people who are, you know, just want to know and, and feel like, they need more answers. So I do my best. I can't keep up with it all the time, but I do my best. And you're welcome to put any of my information out there to share with your viewers. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. And uh, once again, man, it was an honor, man, to have this interview with Mr. Greg Caden. Thank you for taking time out of your morning. Because it's 8 o'clock over there where you're at. It's 11 where I'm at. It's early. <laughs> Nobody usually does interviews this early, but thank you for taking time out your day yeah, and doing cool. this because I almost woke up late. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I I got my wife. I was like, what time is it? She said 1030. Oh, man, I got to get up. I got to get up. Get up at 1030, man. Your day should be half over at 1030. No, I know. I'm usually, my, usually I'm up early, but uh, I drunk a little bit too much last night, so I had to uh, give me some rest. But it was an honor to have you, man. And Mr. Greg Caden, you he did told y'all on Facebook, Twitter, type the name in. If you want to learn more about him, y'all know that y'all can contact me, DM me at, at Chicken Talk Radio Live, LLC on Instagram.com, at Chicken Talk R A D on uh, Twitter, Chicken Talk Radio Live on MySpace. Yes, I, MySpace is popular again, guys. Uh, and you already know, man. Yeah, MySpace is actually back. People don't pay no pay, pay in no mind. But uh, yeah, it, it's back and they changed the whole platform of it, man. But this was an honor, man, <laughs> to have this interview. Hey, thank you. And I, again, I wanted to apologize to you. I kind of was, you know, a little bit hard to try hard to pin down. So I apologize for that extra effort that you needed to make because I'm, I'm just trying to manage my time the best I can and I fail at it a lot. <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. You're a businessman. 
it was an honor to get you after you did Vlad TV and all those other big platforms. I was like, man, I ain't gonna be able to get this man. He done did Vlad TV. He done did everything. I'm an up and coming joint, but by the blessings of that man upstairs, That's right. uh, it happened, man. But like I always say, man, this is uh, Chicken Talk Radio Live. Every Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. West Coast. Your boy True Knowledge. Knowledge without the D. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is me, man. The best radio podcast station. On the East Coast period, brought to you by Jerk Sauce, 25 West Mercury Boulevard, Hampton, Virginia, 23669. The best Jamaican food on this side of the water with sounds brought to you by DJ Sniper and DJ Slick Rick. And once again, thank you to Mr. Greg Cater for showing up to this interview today. The interview will be up later on today. And it will be on all streaming platforms. And the video footage for the interview will be up next week. But thank you, Mr. Cater. Thank you, and God bless you and your family, man. All right. You have a great weekend. You do the same, sir. Will do, sir. All right.